<clears throat> Thank you so much for hosting Pamela and Mace and all the other amazing volunteers and board members. And to you, Sangha, for showing up. So sweet. It really does feel like a special evening. We get to gather here and kind of come back once again for, yeah, another opportunity to deepen our practice together. And I'm sure many of us have other practices we do, maybe even other communities we sit with. Um, this one is, is so special and really a precious place for us to, I, I would say, not only practice Dharma, but to really discuss the Dharma. Uh, I am still kind of reeling from our conversation last week on the difference between equ equanimity and Nirvana. So we're gonna continue on that a bit today. It's, it's rich, very, um, a lot to say. And, you know, tonight is, is a really beautiful and auspicious night. Some of you know, of course, that we're starting this Lunar New Year, Year of the Water Tiger and also that it was a new moon. And maybe some of you got to see tonight, the moon put on an unbelievable show for us. Just this beautiful little sliver, just unbelievably captivating. And it's so interesting because of course we often, we celebrate the full moon a lot in Buddhist practices and full moon is associated with awakening. But that little almost empty moon and that moon, that kind of um, hungry moon, right? That's not full, but that it has just a sliver. I, I find it also really inspiring as this kind of moment of starting anew and beginning a new cycle. And I think, especially given it's the, the new year tonight in our meditation, uh, we'll focus a bit more on intention. Admittedly, I'm gonna really emphasize our intention to really take on this bodhisattva path. So our intention of how we wake up for the sake of all beings. That will be a preliminary part of our practice. And we're gonna do a practice tonight that I, I really do consider to be a wisdom practice. And this is a practice of mindfulness of phenomena. So our, we have made it in this chapter. It just, I was looking ahead in this book um, to our chapters ahead, it just, it is so rich. I mean, quite, quite literally, it's not only on the path to enlightenment, like it is the path. It really is giving us these core teachings in, in such a lovely way. So we're kind of finishing up this section here on these spiritual qualities or paramitas. So we have already made our way through the first, uh, I'd say, I think it's five of these. And we are now made our way to wisdom. This whole week, as I knew we were heading into this night to be teaching on wisdom, I, I just, I have to admit, I was like, wow, this, I wish Chandra was here. I don't want to have to do wisdom. Wisdom's everything. It's, you know, so much is in wisdom. So it's been, yeah, really nice to reflect on a way for us to engage with this important topic together. I think making wisdom feel fresh, making wisdom feel not this you know, far away idea or Buddhist ideal, but right here um, is so meaningful. And you know, all the other paramitas, uh, generosity, discipline, patience, joyous effort, and concentration, all of them kind of are infused by the wisdom. Without them, they, they only are just kind of perfunctory or transactional. So wisdom is such an important part of um, this entire chapter and these, these practices or these qualities that help us so much. The reason I think the practice of mindfulness of phenomena is such an interesting one as a wisdom practice is you know, a key feature of wisdom is really seeing things as, they, as it truly is and recognizing the impermanence or every ever-changing nature and being able to also see the interconnection and interdependence. These are not complex ideas and they're not actually that challenging. We see them everywhere all the time. It is very hard to hold it fully in our mind. So when we practice something so simple, which is just noticing phenomena, 
right? Our kind of most core function as a human being, noticing, experiencing phenomena. But when we do so from this point of view of wisdom, when we notice that, wis that our phenomena so quickly become caught up in our perspective, our projection, and our point of view, it's beautiful insight we can have in the moment. So noticing, for example, that if we're focusing on the sensations in our body and there's something maybe tight and warm right at the shoulder, so quickly we notice it as unpleasant and painful. So how do we work with noticing our phenomena as a means to wisdom? It's a way for us to really identify how often our, our mind and thoughts can in some ways get in the way or obscure the experience of our awareness. And so in this practice of mindfulness phenomena, we'll build our way up towards that spacious open awareness, the clear luminosity of our own mind. Wisdom, I just love all the ways that wisdom is described and, and its quality when we have <clears throat> our experience of wisdom itself. And, you know, one of the um, kind of four qualities of wisdom is this like self arising wisdom and this primordial wisdom, not something we need to learn, but something we're kind of revealing. So that's what we'll start off with. And then we'll, yeah, get into a discussion on wisdom, um, especially as it relates to the paramitas, but also a bit more broadly and how we bring this understanding of wisdom into equanimity and nirvana and our ability to really feel like we know why we're on this path. We know where it's headed. So with that tall order, please find a posture that really can support your practice. For all practices, and, and I'd say especially for this one where we're gonna be noticing subtle experiences, as much as you can find a posture where stillness is possible is great. If that means lying down, wonderful. But some posture where you're not gonna to have to fidget too much. Can I ask you to make me a co-host in case I have to mute? Thanks. You guys didn't know this, but last time I muted sometime during our meditation practice and then couldn't unmute. And um, Pamela and Mace were deep in their practice and didn't notice, it was a long, nice long pause. And I was like, oh. <laughs> How am I gonna, how am I gonna keep going? And luckily something drew Pamela out of her absorption and I was able to unmute. It was good. It was an extra long time for people to practice. Because sometimes there's background noise in my home with the cat or whatever else is happening. So finding a good posture that is supportive and checking in on our posture, not to make it rigid, but as a way to really remind our body we're doing something new and different. So finding that sense of stability and feeling the uprightness of the spine. Making sure we have plenty of space and room for our breath to move through our belly fully. Finding a position for our hands that allows our shoulders and neck to feel at ease. Softening around the eyes and through the eyelids and imagining a gaze whether eyes are opened or slightly closed. That's just not focusing on anything at all. Imagine a slight lift of the heart at the chest. And find a position where the chin is ever so gently tilted forward, 
also helping <clears throat> lift up through the spine. Take a moment here and feel ourselves situated, supported by the ground below us. Inhabiting the space around us. And situating ourselves in time. For those of us here on the West Coast, knowing that the moon just dipped away with its very new sliver. And for all of us knowing it's the second day of February, 2022, a new year in some cultures. Connecting to the sense of the temperature outside, to the night sky. And connecting to this constellation of other beings gathered here tonight. And connecting to our breath. Feeling this preciousness of breath. To help us settle and stabilize the mind, we can do a practice of counting. At the very top of the inhale, beginning the count with one. And then releasing that number, the sound of it in your own head, even before you exhale. And allowing yourself to count one, through 21, just briefly noting at the top of the inhale. Otherwise, allow the attention to be fully immersed in this experience of breathing.
And if you lose track, if you become distracted or carried away, no problem. Come back, consider counting again, starting from one. Gently shifting away our focus from the breath to the mind and imagination. And taking a moment here to consider our intention for being here. And tonight I'll invite you to allow that intention to be truly great. Boundless. An intention that is like a guiding light. An intention that reveals a deep aspiration of the heart. But truly what our heart desires. Considering within this intention how we can erase, lift up our awakened heart. The heart that knows any true desire is not ours alone, but a desire for all beings. Any happiness or peace, any strength or comfort that we desire and seek must be shared. There is no peace, there is no happiness without the possibility of including all beings. Outrageous though this aspiration may be, let's give ourselves a moment for an outrageous heart. And 
considering this beautiful aspiration that we could be an island for those who need landfall, a lamp for those needing light, that we could be a bed for those needing rest, and for those who are suffering, we could be both medicine and doctor. And then without words, images, or concepts, simply let the light of the aspiration or intention that connects with you fully illuminate the chest, the heart, the body. Noticing if there are any sensations in the body associated with this invocation, this invitation to really feel the light and the warmth of this awakened heart. And as we fully move into the next phase of practice, continue noticing all that can be noticed through the tactile sensations in the body. And while doing so, let them simply be felt sensations. without thinking about my knee or my elbow or this ache. In what is felt, let it simply be felt. when you get distracted, carried away, no problem. Just relax and release and return your interest to noticing the sensations just as they are throughout the body.
Now gently directing our attention to the sense portal of hearing. Noticing all that can be heard. Sounds that are near and sounds that are far. Sounds that are steady or sounds that just arise and pass away. And as you receive these sounds without reaching out towards them, again, letting them just be sounds that are heard without thinking that's a bus or a car, that's my refrigerator humming. Just letting the sounds be sounds. And as we notice these sounds, you may notice that they are subtly changing. And of course, the ones that come and go, and even the ones that are steady. The more we can bring our wise, open attention to the experience of sound, the more subtleties, nuances, and intricacies may arise in the whole tapestry of the sense portal of sound.
gently shifting now, directing our attention to the visual. Doing so with our eyes closed in order to really focus on the light and the subtle patterns behind the eyes. This very limited version for most of us of our visual field. Again, bringing a more precise attention to the subtle differences of light and shadow movement just behind our eyes. Being careful not to strain, but to remain supple in our attention. Again, noticing the changes and the subtle shifts. And shifting from the sense portal of sight into the sense portal of our mind and perception. Just as we notice the subtle shifts and changes in the body, in sound, and in visual. Noticing the movement of the mind. The thoughts, and memories, and images which arise. And letting them arise simply as movements of the mind, without engaging, energizing, or judging whatever is coming, and thereby allowing it to simply pass away.
again with the pliancy of mind and body, a deep existential relaxation. And a vividness. Noticing and watching the movements of the mind. If you become caught up or carried away in the movements of the mind, again, no problem. And relax, release, and return to this observation. We give so much of our daily attention to these thoughts that arise. Even more so often than to our body, the sound, even what we see. Seeing if we can hear, just be with these thoughts without giving them that full power. Seeing their nature, transient, ever-changing. Maybe the thoughts feel like a waterfall or a rushing river. But we may also glimpse periods of tranquility, openness amid and through the thoughts and movements of the mind.
Now gently bringing the attention once again into the body, into sound and what is heard through the subtle play of light behind the eyelids, the mind. arriving right back here to this present moment, this evening, this community. And just once more, reflecting on our intention. Letting the full power of our practice energize our intention. Thank you for your practice. Any questions or reflections on the practice? You can raise your hand, put it in chat. <laughs> Either it was really good or everybody fell asleep. Hard to say. Somewhere in between. How, how was it for folks that this is such a, a familiar practice to many of you to try to kind of bring in a little bit of that wisdom into the practice directly? Right. So kind of noticing the ever-changing nature of these phenomena and maybe seeing into um, a bit of how these thoughts can, can dominate our experience.
Yes. Oh, you're still muted. Good evening, everyone. Hi. Nice to see everyone here. Um, you know, I think it's a lofty uh, subject, that of wisdom. I think that's why we keep quiet because it seems so, so big. And what we say about wisdom, you know, it seems like it's huge. And uh, <clears throat> on my, when, when I think of, uh, of wisdom, uh, it just, it, it keeps me like speechless. I don't know what to say. And um, even when you were giving instructions, this the, the, the little chapter about wisdom also in the book, just it's just two little pages, I think. And it seems so abstract to me. I couldn't make head of or entails about it, not at all, uh, as opposed to so many others, which are like longer and, and there's, there's, this one especially was very strange to me. Hmm. Um, but uh, the, the thing that, that came up with me is that I've been thinking a lot about something that you said the other, I don't think, it, I don't remember if it was this last class or the one before about um, something that maybe it's not related, but now that we were, we were talking about wisdom, it came to me again about anger. Mm -hmm. And you read up a passage about anger and it, it just struck me because it, it talked about how anger was capable, a moment of anger was capable of like uh, exploding all the good, the good deeds that you had done in your life almost. Maybe it was, uh, I'm exaggerating, but it had that power. And it, uh, for some reason, I've been thinking all these weeks about it. And now that you talked about wisdom, I thought, what is what would an instruction on on wisdom be towards anger hmm. wow yeah ask. yeah mm -hmm. i'm so glad you asked and i'm so glad you shared the feeling of um maybe like a density of this one um this topic and yeah you know it's funny um there's only two readings for wisdom you know, generosity has like seven pages, you know, discipline only has one. So it's the only one that has uh, as few. Um, so we'll, we will read them and unpack. I will say, um, so that, um, that passage on anger, you're, you're, it's pretty close. It's a moment of anger, you know, is lifetimes worth of karma that, and merit that is, and I think that that's, completely inaccurate <laughs> so I, I hope that that point got across I, I think that that's a an, an outdated view I think that what they're especially you know um, my my friend and colleague uh, venerable Tenzin Choki you know is often saying that that a translation like that with anger often is really intent to harm Made me angry a lot. And, and it's not just this true, I want someone to be in pain. It's more like, oh, I'm annoyed. You're in my way. Right? That's that's most of us anger. Get out of my way. And that in which is very different than I want you to die and I want to hurt you. <laughs> so I think that that malicious kind of intensity and still lifetimes, come on. I mean, it is, you know. Supposedly it takes so many lifetimes for us to even like get fully on the bodhisattva path. So, you know, if we're, we're talking in these very large time scales and still I, I struggle because there's a part of that that just feels so um, deterministic as though someone who at one point in their life caused bodily harm to another, that they're never gonna, you know, kind of outlive that. and that's just not true. Time and time again, we see these amazing transformations for people who have caused harm, great harm, maybe, you know, and um, interpersonal violence or war or otherwise. So I absolutely not. Now, when it comes to wisdom and anger, I think it's a really beautiful question. 
you know, there are some teachings on anger that I, I think are important to look at that say that we can actually have quite a momentum of clear seeing with our anger, but we can only do so with wisdom. And the wisdom is being able to not feel kind of attached and connected to our anger. So for example, let me think of some time that I was annoyed today. I'm sure I can think of at least one. Um, this is really silly, right? But um, my computer wasn't working. My keyboard wasn't working. And it was really important moment in a meeting. I was trying to take notes and it just wouldn't take notes. There was a huge frustration for a moment. That doesn't, that doesn't uh, eradicate lifetimes of my good merit. And what it could possibly show me was, you know, how important it was for me and that, how important it really was. Wow, I really want to take notes, really care about what's being said. And of course, I could find a piece of paper, I could, I could write. And there was also a part of me that saw, like, I don't trust my memory. I feel I need to take notes. So we can, from our emotions, learn a lot. And I think from anger, we, we can have some wisdom. What is actually in the way here? What's really the experience that is, you know, feeling blocked? I actually think I probably learn way more from my anger than from my joy. You know, the things we get frustrated about, things we get like downright rageful about, really, really great source of wisdom. But it's only available to us if we aren't kind of like directing it outward. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I was really fortunate. I had a, a retreat with my teacher this weekend, Jennifer Wellwood, and she was really talking about um, the wisdom nature um, that we all, we all need in order to face the heartbreak of our world. Very, very easy for us to succumb to blame and anger. And doing so is, is not engaging our wisdom. Our wisdom is able to see and understand and make sense of what's happening and not become so shut down by our blame and despair. I, I mean, I think we talk about this almost every class because it's so important, but wisdom is a big part of it. Wisdom is a big part of it. And, you know, my one liner for wisdom would just be, yeah, I, I actually can see how everything is changing and everything is connected. And when I really see that, when I really, really see it, I'm free. And I think wisdom has that capacity for us. So thank you for the honesty and the question. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts related to that? Milarepa is just called out. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Do you want to say more on Milarepa? Well, he, you know, he's like the most important Tibetan sort of saint teacher, and he did terrible things. He killed people, and then he went through this, you know, he went finally to find a teacher, and he, the teacher was very cold to him, actually, and very difficult on him, but he was so determined that, you know, in one lifetime, he became enlightened. He overcame, you know, all the, the horrible things that he had done. And so, so it is possible, I guess, to redeem yourself in this lifetime. Absolutely. Even redeem feels like a value, like a heavy value judgment, right? It's, just, yeah. you know, we, like mistakes are so natural. And how do we, you know, keep learning and yeah, and transform. I mean, yeah, Milarepa, quite an impressive, quite an impressive story. Such a good one for us to have. Yeah. So I'm gonna read just these two passages here because they're both fairly short and uh, I will take up the challenge of unpacking them um, so <clears throat> the first one here by Kangyur Rinpoche, in all there are three kinds of wisdom, the wisdom of hearing, the wisdom of reflection, and the wisdom of meditation. 
I'll stop there. I, I, I love, I've, I've, I've read this in, in various texts before. It's funny. There's um, in different, in every tradition, they have a different set of the types of wisdom. And even within the Tibetan tradition, there's different types of wisdom. But this one, I really like for us as practitioners. So right now we're doing the kind of hearing, right? Or if we're listening to the teachings, reflections is when we then consider like, how does that relate to me? And the meditation is actually practicing it. And so I like that idea that wisdom isn't something, you know, that we just receive. It's not just hearing. We need to apply it and then we need to practice it. Gradual training in these will result in the perfect, in the perfect accomplishment of vipassana, primordial and non-conceptual wisdom. This wisdom destroys the defilements that prevent the attainment of liberation and removes cognitive obscurations that prevent omniscience. It's funny, it, it is actually dense, but I, I know some of these code words, so it feels uh, a bit natural here. Um, and, you know, it's, it's actually really beautiful. It really follows so well from just the prior um, reading we did on concentration. And then, you know, the, the prior reading, just actually the page before it says, Shamatha prepares the mind for the insight of Vipassana to show the practitioner all phenomena are inherently devoid of substantial experience. So shamatha concentration, like really paying attention, such an important aspect that kind of opens us up to this Vipassana. And this isn't the Vipassana that um, is often um, we often hear that word. This is a vipassana of more insight. And the insight here is that everything changes. The insight is what we just practice, that this, this phenomena are always changing. So then the wisdom here is a wisdom that sees how everything is changing. And it's also a wisdom that sees how everything is connected. And I really like saying everything is connected a little bit more than I like saying non-duality. Non-duality sounds very highfalutin. It's very easy to understand it as, as connection, interdependence. I think that interbeing, yes, Thich Nhat Hanh, beautiful phrase that he used as a way of understanding that difficult to understand. And what's so important, of course, about that interconnection is, is, again, what we were practicing with our aspiration. Our freedom includes all of us. Like we, There's no way, and many people are trying, there's no way to create your little perfect palace away from the suffering of the world. It doesn't exist. Climate change shows us that more than ever, but you know, everything. We are connected. And this sense also of interconnection, it's so just, it's not just a, a heavy, difficult reality. It's so beautiful. We're not alone. We're completely not alone. So this idea that wisdom destroys the defilement, it, it essentially kind of removes this idea that, um, there's any value in trying to just accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. And it removes the idea that we should try to avoid things that are hard. Like it helps us with our delusions to just see. Yeah, it's, it's nice. I, I like having my nice teacup with my nice tea. It's not that I renounce everything, but I don't think that if I just get the perfect cup of tea, I'll be happy forever, right? It really, it, that wisdom is what allows us to be happy seek the true causes of happiness. Okay, I see in the chat here from Walt, the way the sutras, especially some of the indirect Mahayana sutras treat karma and rebirth seems to drift very much back towards the rigid determinism of classic Brahmanism. Good equals reborn as a king, unwholesome, reborn as a beggar, mean, reborn ugly, simplification for the masses. It's clouding my wish to attain wisdom. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, right. 
it's so, I actually think we're gonna, I don't know how soon it is, but we're coming up on another section on karma. Um, it's interesting because I do think that, um, that wisdom will make us free. And I was thinking very much of this question that we talked about last week, what is nirvana and do we want it? <laughs> uh, and what is equanimity and, and do we want that more possibly? I guess I'm kind of tipping the scales here. And with nirvana, we're saying that there's a, a liberation from the hassles, you know, from the difficulties of the cessation. We no longer feel kind of pricked by the world, pulled by the world, pinched by the world, as opposed to an idea of maybe not in opposition, but that is a bit different of equanimity where we're very much in the world and of the world, but we can hold it. And um, yeah, well, I think it is an, an interesting one with this, um, you know, these really kind of harsh uh, admonishments upon anger or doing things wrong or getting it wrong as though um, we could be tarnishing our lives ahead in just a, a careless day or period of our life. And, you know, I know that that's supposed to be inspiring as we talked about last time, or maybe a couple times ago, it's some of these really intense admonishments are supposed to be inspiring for us. What will shake us, what will shake us out of our stupor? But often they just feel like, yeah, I don't want any of that. <laughs> if, if this is what you're offering, that doesn't sound like something I want and in the tone I'm interested in. Um, as a small personal aside, I had a, in my, my early explorations into my Judaism, I had a real crisis of confidence about the Old Testament God. He was so mean, so mean, punished people. I'm like, why do I want that? So anyway, I, I can resonate with that. Um, questioning that deep questioning of why would I want to be part of um, this type of, of point of view um, back to this this stanza here or this passage here <clears throat> so this wisdom destroys the defilements that prevent the attainment of liberation and removes cognitive obscurations that prevent omnis omniscience and it's so interesting Sometimes in that practice of mindfulness of phenomena, when I really, I have this, like, it's almost, I feel like I can build my way up to experiencing my mind and awareness. It's not that I would call it omniscience, but I feel a presence of everything at once. And that is, um, I wouldn't say I feel wisdom in that moment, but I, but it is, it's like a real clear way of experiencing that feels like um, very lucid, um, and very permeating. <clears throat> and then the rest of it goes on. It's the unmistakable knowledge, first, of ultimate reality, the profound nature of things, and second, of all phenomena that arise within the sphere of deluded perception. So this wisdom here, it's both recognizing that there's a reality that's greater than what we're often tuned into on a day-to-day -day basis, and that these phenomena that are often getting in the way of our ultimate reality or seeing it, they're just, they're kind of pulling our attention away as a result of projection. So that this wisdom, we may not be able to live in ultimate reality, but we can also just even have a sense of ultimate reality. And part of that is by recognizing that all these phenomena that are experienced, that we experience day to day, my gosh, we just are constantly judging. You know, I don't know for all of you, but I, I can, I can identify I'm on, I'm on the cross section of, I think four different bus lines and a muni line. And at different times of the day, depending on if I'm in the window open, I can, I can almost tell what bus it is and like which, you know, like I know. And to not let my mind know, 
There's nothing really wrong with that perception of, is it the 24 to visit arrow or is that the F train or, you know, it doesn't really matter. But we really can see in these kind of automatic projections, just how hard it is for us to rest in this open awareness. And this, one could say, wisdom nature of just noticing the kind of, that kind of, I'm going to, I'm already judging it, see that awful sound of when the F train goes around and it's metal on metal, right? Can I just hear it as, oh, high pitched screeching and then hmm, low humming, you know, kind of turning. So this, you know, how hard it is for us to actually see that our perception is ours. It's not the world out there. It's really, really tough really, really tough. Um, and sometimes it may be clearer to us, but when we're in the grip of our emotion, very almost impossible, right? When we're feeling anger, being able to recognize um, the goodness in others who we're angry at, especially the people we live with, right? We're angry at them and all of a sudden they're like the enemy. There's never been anything good about them. I can't believe they've been around so long, right? It's, it's, it's interesting. And you know, so back to your question on what is you know, wisdom with anger. That that person this morning was someone I liked <laughs> and I might like them tomorrow, right? So just that ability to see the changes. Hmm, yeah, and Laura, Laura says here, I have the sense that wisdom comes from suffering. It's interesting you say that because um, one thing I was going to mention this evening, of course, many of us have heard this is, you know, wisdom and compassion are always spoken about in the same breath. Not always, so often, right? And, and I absolutely think that wisdom can come from suffering, but I can't imagine it could do so without compassion. And when we talk about wisdom and compassion, often it'll just be said compassion and emptiness, which I think is, again, much harder term I think it's hard, like non-duality is hard um, of a term to understand. When we think of this beautiful union or these two wings of the bird of wisdom and compassion, they're balancing each other out. We're able to see that just raw reality and able to have that tender heart. So there can be a lot of suffering that we can maybe see clearly, but without having the kind of you know, heartfulness quality, kindness quality. It can turn into, you know, something that's like a avoidance or denial. Um, maybe not denial, because if we see it with wisdom, we aren't denying it, but a, you know, suppression and dampening. Yeah. I guess what I mean is I think sometimes like, you know, it's that, you know, the uh, definition of insanity is doing something over and over again and thinking you'll get the same, you know, you'll get a different result. And there's a kind of wisdom you get in life sometimes when you mm -hmm. keep doing the same thing, getting the same result. And one day you wake up and you're like, yeah, maybe I should stop doing that. Yeah. And that's a kind of, that's what I mean by wisdom. Like you coming out of suffering and I guess, I don't know, maybe you have to have a certain amount of self-compassion and humor to get to that place. Yeah. But, you know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you it's such a classic um, trope in a way that we we almost discard it, but like, yeah, like we learn from our suffering. Like that is, that's how we learn. And our are these great periods of um, of loss and transition often end up being these incredible teachers for us. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's interesting to think of what would it be like to have wisdom without compassion about our suffering? Like, what would that even mean? Um, it feels like it might be clinical, aloof somehow. And if we had compassion with the wisdom, we would definitely go back and do the same thing again. <laughs> right? That's what Pema Chodron calls the idiot compassion or the doormat compassion. Like, just not really um, being able to understand. Lisa writes here, my perceptions can hold me hostage 
to being present. Hmm. So does that mean they like, uh, they can take you away or they're yes. kind of, yeah. It's like a, yeah. Hostage is the right word. Hijacked. I love emotion hijacking. Hijack hostage. Yeah. They, hostages, they're holding on to me. They're not letting me go. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's incredibly sticky. And again, wisdom, wisdom's easy when things feel pretty good. Very hard when we're this, when there's discomfort. Um, okay. So equipped with such knowledge, one is able to pass swiftly through the city of existence, which karma and defilements have made so difficult to cross. <laughs> it's kind of a sweet image. There's like this city and it's just thick with karma and defilements and we can only pass through it with wisdom. Thus one goes on beyond suffering and reaches nirvana with ease. The six transcendent perfections, generosity and so forth are causally interrelated and arranged progressively in terms of subtlety and elevation. They are called transcendent because they are combined with transcendent wisdom. So again, you know, that each of these paramitas, each of these values that we've looked at really require wisdom. Um, this one, this one, I, I might, um, I'll just say it. I, I have absolutely no commentary on it. I think it's interesting. Full of vigor, the son of a barren woman climbed a ladder made of rabbit's horn and swallowed the sun and the moon, thus plunging beings into a sea of darkness. That's what belief in a self is like. I think the modern update would be, um, you know, like a, gosh. Because the son of a barren woman, right? Like It's actually a joke. Like a barren woman does not have a son. Rabbits don't have horns. It's just not that funny. Um, so it's like, it's like, I'm trying to find a way for it to feel, you know, it's like an impossible thing, right? Like our country unites Democrats and Republicans together and we all decide on universal health care. This is what belief in a self is like. That's, that's messed up, but it's, it's meant to be ironic. Um, Denise, I see your hand there. Yeah, I just got thrown for a loop with that one. I have a question and a comment, and then I'll try and be really quick. Um, it, it was a wonderful meditation. I came in from another community where they were talking about tapestry mm. and our images of things. So I was coming in with this rainbow image and silk and wool and connections. And then I got into the meditation and it came back and I was feeling all these links and and compassion and wisdom have just been real themes for me. As you spoke about the master saying one moment of anger can just mess everything up <laughs> seriously for a long time, having worked in conflict resolution for decades, but also, um, you know, I've been working with this stuff probably since I was nine Mm. different levels meditating and doing stuff but not profoundly like you all have been but I really got um, into trouble when I became a parent and was concerned about my kids in very serious ways and I got hijacked even though I knew better mm. and coming into this training over the last year has been so helpful and then again and again I see the words of my perfect teacher and what we're getting here, to me, it speaks truth hmm. that moment or longer, but that that place of not being able to shift and understand and move into compassion and wisdom, you, I can create a real mud hole of hmm. um, nasty karma that I'm just working my way out of. Hmm. But this all, you know, it does create a, a bridge, a tapestry, a a way of just what you were saying before that that gets through it but my question was what page are we on because i'm, I'm still back on 110 129 oh we're not that far away okay <laughs> thank you for sharing that 
Yeah, it's beautiful to hear the teachings coming together. They should. And I love tapestry. I think it's a, a beautiful uh, analogy in some ways for our life experiences, the phenomena, our perceptions, and, and the teachings. They should weave together, you know. Um, so last week it was, you know, sew the cushion to your pants, right? So you're practicing everywhere. And the teachings should start to feel very much a part of our, our reflective daily experience. Um, it's really nice, you know, today, especially, I was really attempting for a good part of my day to live with wisdom, like really live with wisdom, which included like driving somewhere. What is it like driving somewhere with wisdom? What is it like, you know, in all these very um, alive ways? And it, it's beautiful. It really can start um, reaching out back to you or kind of feeling that connection. So not just listening to this and hearing this, but yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I'll read, I will read this last page on 130. I think there's some real beautiful parts here. When I contemplate the outside world, I see the deceptive appearances of relative truth. Ethereal shimmers devoid of ultimate reality. I, the aimless wanderer, have peace of mind. When I look at my thinking mind, I see only movements without trace, like those of the wind. Ungraspable presence where birth and death are one. I, the aimless wanderer, have peace of mind. The painful nature of cyclic existence is as illusory as last night's dream, ungraspable and devoid of reality. I, the aimless wanderer, have peace of mind. Liberation, all bliss, only the pure essence of my own mind. Is nature, its nature is emptiness beyond a reference point. I, the aimless wanderer, have peace of mind. The duality of samsara and nirvana is only concepts of good and bad. It is actually a non-duality beyond all reference point. I, the aimless wanderer, have peace of mind. So it's really, you know, kind of these beautiful descriptions of what it would be like to have kind of transcended the mind of hope and fear. You know, that's what gets us so bounded up. Um, and, you know, in this tradition, this kind of idea of like the wandering hermit, um, you're able to see reality as it is just so clearly um, and so able to um, I, the one I really love here is the, the illusory, the painful nature of cyclic, cyclic existence as illusory as last night's dreams, ungraspable and devoid of reality. And I like thinking of that because it will come back to anger again. When we're in the grip of anger, it's like we're in a dream. We've created the situation that's, you know, a lot of fabrication of our own mind but we don't know. We don't know we're dreaming. We don't know we're caught in the anger. And wisdom is, is seeing we're caught, right? Seeing the nature of reality. Um, I do want to share here. So I mentioned I had a retreat with uh, my teacher, Jennifer Wellwood, and happily she was talking about wisdom nature. And she said that this poem she wrote is actually about our wisdom nature, our ability to hold compassion and impermanence at once. Well, this is a favorite poem for Mace, so I'll dedicate it to our wonderful uh, Sangha member. And I, I, I may have shared it with you all, but it, gosh, at least for me, it never gets old. So the poem is called, uh, and I'll put it in the chat. I imagine some of you may be interested. It's, it's worth reading as well as um, listening. <clears throat> The Dakini speaks, my friends, let's grow up. Let's stop pretending we don't know the deal here. Or if we truly haven't noticed, let's wake up and notice. Look, everything that can be lost will be lost. It's simple. How could we have missed it for so long? Let's grieve our losses fully like ripe human beings. But please, let's not act so shocked by them. Let's not act so betrayed. 
as though life had broken her secret promise to us. Impermanence is life's only promise to us, and she keeps it with ruthless impeccability. To a child, she seems cruel, but she's only wild, and her compassion exquisitely precise, brilliantly penetrating, luminous with truth. She strips away the unreal to show us the real. This is the true ride. Let's give ourselves to it. Let's stop making deals for a safe passage. There isn't one anyway, and the cost is too high. We are not children anymore. The true human adult gives up everything for what cannot be lost. Let's dance the wild dance of no hope. There's such a, so many parts of this poem really speak to me, but you know, I think this idea that let's stop making deals for a safe passage. There isn't one anyway, and the cost is too high. That to me feels like wisdom. You know, like I, I know for myself, as much as I am, I'd like to be an aimless wanderer, I am really concerned with my well being at a just basic level and, you know, having enough and continuing to have enough and affording to live in the city and, and um, top priority. And it's important. And yet, like the preoccupation with trying to make sure everything is safe. It's a fantasy, you know, we live in the, we live in impermanence and unknowing and the cost of trying to make something safe, which is fundamentally unsafe, the cost is too high. So I just, I just really, um, that poem was the first thing I ever heard uh, from her years before I uh, met her or started being a student. And um, yeah, I hope it, I hope it, has some resonance for you all as well. I just think it's it's such a beautiful one. So I hope we have, yeah, only got through half of what I was gonna talk about with wisdom, but I think it was enough. There's so much. And I and you know, I, I really appreciate what um, I think it was Mace or maybe Pamela said in the beginning of on these Wednesday nights, we wanna make these teachings feel relevant and real for us right now. And so I hope we're able to make this idea of wisdom feel a little less lofty. It really, um, it's really saying things as they are. And that's um, such a huge part of our practice and, and really infuses our practice with so much integrity. So, yeah. So let's dedicate our merit here coming back to our intention and arousing our bodhicitta. May our time here together really fuel us in this aspiration, awakening our own hearts for the sake of all beings, that all beings could know safety, all beings could be strong and healthy. All beings would know happiness and its true causes. Thank you all. Wonderful to be together. Enjoy your evening. Happy New Year.